Hello. Yeah, hi everyone. It's so exciting to be talking to all of you here at DevCon and especially talking after Jordi and all the incredible efforts that they have been doing with the white hats. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm Jorge, I'm from the Aragon team and kind of to start framing the talk, I will talk a little bit about what, what Aragon is. Uh, so Aragon is basically a decentralized organizations platform built on Ethereum. We build the software and the infrastructure so running decentralized organizations can become a, a reality. And we are doing this with like uh, focusing on like non-technical users or people that might not have heard about Ethereum as our, as our users. So we're very careful that they will be able to, to use it. And also it's very important for us that this system is extendable enough so it can be used for very like large scale systems, but also for like more tiny things. So when we talk about like future proof smart contracts, what we really mean is like, how can we make sure that the contracts that we're building today for these organizations are going to stand the test of time and can be used by organizations for many years? Uh, so these are kind of like three very obvious points, but the, the first one is like the damn contracts are the best smart contracts and the, what the, this means is like the easiest and the clearer than a smart contract is like the better for, because everyone will know what are the implications of every action uh, and also it decreases the, the, the attack vector for, for it. Also something very important for us is like to make sure that we only do in the smart contracts the, the minimum amount necessary for the system to work. Uh, and this is also because this this, ca this cost will be paid by our users, uh, and this will be the baseline for cost for using Aragon. And also the third point, and the one that I will spend more time during the talk talking about, is like we really feel very strongly that smart contracts need to be upgraded. Um, and this is kind of like a controversial point because there are many things that could go wrong with smart contracts upgradability. Uh, the first thing is like we're building these awesome like trustless systems, but if we put one entity that can arbitrarily change the rules of the game while everyone is doing it, we're basically having like these trustful con contracts again. Uh, but of course, we would see like what what the path to upgrading is. Uh, and also there's this interesting attack vector that could happen in which someone could front run like a, a very important transaction to a, to a smart contract by doing an upgrade. What this means here is like uh, you might be doing a transaction expecting that the system works in one way, but before the transaction is mined, an upgrade to a smart contract happens. Uh, so this is something to, to take care of. Uh, so if, anyway, why do we need smart contract upgrades? Uh, it's because, like, as we all know, this is an extremely young technology, and there will be probably bugs that are better solved at the contract level than at the protocol level. Uh, and also, like, um, we're very young, so there we will be probably need to uh, upgrade our contracts for adding features that our users uh, request in the future. Uh, Doing upgrades right is something that we are very passionate about at Aragon, uh, and I think these are also like very obvious points, but it's very important that the smart contact upgrades are not controlled by just one entity, and a very important point is if they are time delayed, people can then explore the new contract and decide what to do with it. Uh, and also having an efficient uh, uh, governance process be before uh, uh, doing an upgrade is, is very important. So in, in this road of doing like this better like and future Prisma contracts. We kind of started uh, early this year focusing a lot on the Solidity libraries approach. Uh, the Solidity libraries are great because they allow you to really isolate different logic domains that your contract might have. But something that we found is like uh, the problem with libraries is that they're linked at compile time, so you cannot really upgrade them uh, after, doing the, after, after deploying your contract. Um, so we worked with the Zeppelin guys on kind of doing this approach to upgrading soli like Solidity libraries. Um, what, how it basically works is that instead of linking to a specific version of one library, we would link it to a proxy library that would then dispatch the, the library call to, a, to the correct my contract. Uh, this was interesting because it allowed us to change the business logic after the contract was deployed, but the problem with it is like, it didn't allow us to modify the smart contract ABI once it was deployed, so it, it is not possible to add new functions to the contract or to like change one of the function parameters. And also the data structures that you have are going to be fixed forever. Uh, so this is very interesting for solving uh, business logic bugs, but 
it isn't as flexible as we would like like it to be. So with this in mind, we were to, we went to an even simpler approach that we call the delegate proxy. But like how it basically works is like instead of having your your contract logic in your contract, you delegate this contract logic to a different contract by using a, a delegate call. Um, this got especially better with the with after the Byzantium hard fork by when the EIP. 211 got, got included because right now it allows us to, by using the return data size and return data copy in your opcodes, we can check after doing a delegate call or whatever call, we can see how many bytes did the underlying call return and then return that many data. Uh, because before this, you kind of had to specify how many bytes you were expecting from the call and for function calls that return dynamic data types, this wasn't really a, a good idea. And using this technique, there are like two things that we can do here, which we call like flavors, uh, but they're like based on the on this same idea. The first one is like it, this was introduced by Vitalik in, in one Reddit post back in back in the summer, uh, and it's this idea of static static forwarders. So it doesn't really solve the upgradability feature, but the idea is like we can deploy these very very cheap contracts. This is actually an implementation. It, they are so simple that this implementation was done directly in EVM code. Uh, so this allows us to redeploy, like to deploy clone contracts of one contract for a, a very tiny amount of of gas. And this is actually the, the solidity implementation done with the from the code that, that we that we saw before. So these are like very, very cheap to deploy contracts and it's like, as you can see, it's very trivial. Uh, the problem with this is like for every call to these contracts, we add an overhead of gas because we need to do this, this delegate call. So for example, this is not a good idea for a token contract that gets interacted with in many instances. Uh, the gas cost is like 700, gas for every additional delegate call that we have to pay in every in every call. Uh, but on the flip side, we get very, very cheap uh, contract deployment costs. So for example, for a contract that takes 1 million gas to deploy, the moment that we do more than 1,300 contracts called to this contract, it will no longer be worth it in gas-wise to do it. But for example, an, an example of a contract that I think it's a perfect example to how this can be used is with the ENS deed contract that gets basically created every time an ENS bid is done. So with this contract, uh, if instead of creating a full contract with, with its code that gets it stored into the blockchain every time, we created a, a proxy contract like this, this would have been the, the gas savings would have been very, very significant. Uh, and I think this is the perfect example for this because it's a contract that gets deployed many times but gets used individually very little times. So with this same idea, uh, we can, like, if instead of this address that we're doing the call is being a constant, if we make it flexible and bearable, we can actually do upgradability in this in the same way. So here is like an implementation of how this how this would look like. As you can see, this is also like using the code that we presented before, but here instead of doing the, the call to a, the same constant address every time, we're doing it to a to a an ad, to an address that we can change. So basically calling the upgrade function here would change the code where the where the contract is using. The problem with this is like, because we're using delegate calls, which is basically telling the contract, okay, don't run my, code, my contract code here, I want to delegate this to this other address. We need to make sure that the storage, like we're in the correct version of the storage. Uh, so for example, in the, in the previous slide, we see that both contracts like inherit the same, uh, the same storage contract. That's because they both need to know where the where the storage is. And for more more complex cases in which you're introducing inheritance and, and all that, you need to be very careful with how you add the, the storage. So this is actually uh, important to understand how Solidity is storing or or data. So basically, the, the the it's a very simple idea. It it starts counting like how many mem like storage slots do you have in your contract starting for the from the most basic contract so it would start like counting like this would be stored at the at the zero th at the zero slot we're talking about the this contract storage but it inherits from this one so this would be stored at the zero slot this would be stored at the at the first slot of the of the contract and so on and so forth uh, 
But for example, in the case of an extract, this would be like as if we put this in line right here and this track like quote unquote didn't exist at all. Uh, the case of the case of arrays is a little bit more complex. For static length arrays, like this is, behaves exactly in the same way as as a struct does, and it just puts it in line. But for a dynamically length array, it would put the story, the, the array length in the storage slot that it, it would be. But then this, the array values are stored in the in the hash of the of the pointer there. In the case of mappings, it's actually a, a bit simpler. Uh, it just stores the value at the hash of the of the key and the position. So the warnings from this is if you're like upgrading from one contract to another, it's it's better to like not add storage in the middle because like as we saw, the, all the storage depends on what the position is inside the contract. So if we add something in the middle, all the storage would be broken. And the problem with this is like this failing will be silent. So it won't like if you don't do it, like nothing will say this this is going to break your contract. But whenever you start using the contract, all the storage will be broken. So an example of an upgrade that that goes wrong is is this one. So because of how the how these tracks uh, get stored in arrays, uh, we have this initial contract in which we 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 are storing an extract of of employee, uh, and then we create like a couple employees here with with their salary. Uh, if after this we upgrade this contract to this payroll to contract in which we had a new a new member to the extract. What, this will, what will happen when we try to fetch the, first, the second employee uh, salary is that it will be stored where the employee's first, where the first employee's joint date is. So it will turn its salary into zero and the salary will be in the joint date. But if, for example, we use the mapping to store this information, because mappings don't store the values subsequently value from value, but they're in the hash, if we do this exact same thing, when after upgrading to this second, or this second contract in which the, we track the, the, the employee here, both salaries would be correct, but both joint dates would be zero because we never, we never set them. So with, with all this, uh, we, we are using this upgradability uh, paradigm in our, in our in our own contracts, we call it Aragon OS, and the, the the implementation is actually very very simple. We have this tiny kernel contract which actually keeps track of all what the how all the contracts that depend on that organization get stored, uh, and we basically store all the all the important business logic in an organization is stored in in apps that are at the at the edges of the system. In this way, we can keep the, the kernel very very simple. So this is like kind of the life cycle for a, rec for a new call, a contract call that gets done to an Aragon OS contract. So we will have the, the initial call here. Uh, this will go to, to, the upgrade to an upgradable proxy contract, but instead of like knowing what its code is, it just asks the kernel whether there has been an upgrade and like what, what is it, the code implementation for this app. Uh, when it gets it, it does a delegate call to the to reveal implementation of the app. In this case, it would be app zero, version one. After that, the app, if the if it's a productive function that it's being performed, this will ask the the contract the kernel again. Oh, hey, can this action be performed right now? So, with this system of of the AC of the access control list and the and the kernel, what we can do is we can use these complex. Um, Governance mechanisms that you could have in your in your organization to decide whether or not an upgrade should happen. Uh, so we are protecting all the upgrades to the kernels and apps to like this. Um, so how would that, like how would an app look like? It's it's very simple. Uh, by by running this app on top of your organization, let's say you're running this counter app to check how many ICOs there were today. So we have this these kind of roles inside the, the app that define what are the different actions that ha can happen inside the app. And then we just protect them here with the auth modifier. Uh, what this will do is like this will plug into the, organ the, the, the organization ACL and basically any or governance mechanism that the organization has can decide who can perform this under what condition. Uh, 
And by doing this, we can actually upgrade the app very simple and add a new and a new storage a new storage value and like a couple new functions and this will work and after performing the upgrade, everyone that's using the app will be will be using this easily. And this is actually how it's going to going to look like. This by making this very, very tiny app, you can plug this counter app that you can write very, very simply and plug it into your organization and use it with all the all the other features that, that Argon has. And yeah, that's everything for us. Uh, if you are curious about this, you can contact us there. Thank you.